Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wimsy, one of my writers in this case, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew Markham, that is. There's a few Matthews. Uh, let's jump into it, shall we? The Lipstick Killer. Did the Chicago PD frame an innocent man for murder? Oh, I love a good conspiracy. I mean, I don't, because if this guy went to murder because he was framed, that would suck. But I mean, like, I like the idea of conspiracies. I find them exciting, although mostly unbelievable. Just as it was for nearly every country involved in the Second World War, the early 1940s were a period of rapid change in America that saw nearly every city adapted to fit the war effort in some way. Chicago, Illinois is where our story takes place, and it was no exception. Since the U.S.'s entry into the war in 1941, the city's already robust manufacturing sector had expanded immensely. And by 1945, the year during which our story begins, more than 40 railroads then snaked through it. Wow! So America had a past where they had railways, because today it's kind of a joke, right? Like there's Amtrak, but it's like most people just drive everywhere, right? <laughs> Each one ran day and night, importing raw materials to one of over 260 factories that produced everything from first aid kits and uniforms to engines for the now famous B-29 bomber. To staff these factories, women now made their way into the workforce for the first time, as most men were either performing other critical jobs who had been shipped overseas to fight. These women, combined with over half a million new residents that had come to Chicago seeking work. God damn. How big's Chicago in like the 40s? Surely that's a huge influx. Hey Siri, how many people live in Chicago? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, Siri? You got nothing? What? He just said sorry, and that's it. Siri, do better. Yo, ChatGPT, my dude, you're gonna sort us out. Siri's being useless. Chicago, 1942. What was the population? Roughly. Hey. In 1942, Chicago's population was around 3.4 million people. God damn, so 3.4 million people, half a million extra is a huge influx of people. Where are they all going to live? Hello there. Before we continue, I just want to tell you that this video is sponsored by Keeps. Now, even though my hair journey is over, until Keeps get up their hair cloning technology, chop, chop, Keeps, let's go. But look, it doesn't have to be over for you, thanks to our sponsor today, Keeps. Ever wish you could tackle hair loss without leaving your couch? Well... That's where keeps come in, don't they? Say goodbye to awkward doctor's office visits and pharmacy runs. Just hop online, complete a quick consultation, and voila! You're matched with a licensed medical provider who crafts a personalized treatment plan just for you. It's like having a hair specialist in your computer which is cool. And here's the kicker. Keeps delivers your treatments discreetly to your door. No more weird glances at the pharmacy counter. Oh, you big up, what's that for? Just stop my hair falling out like an old ass man or like that bald guy on the internet. Plus, with flexible delivery options, you're in control. Just pause or cancel your plan anytime. It's clinically proven treatments designed to combat hair loss head on. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate regrowth, or just amp up your hair game, Keeps has got you covered. And with over 5,000 five-star reviews, you know you're in good hands. Plus, they've got a whole bunch of other stuff that's useful for your hair. Thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade. Working together to enhance your results and keep your locks looking luscious. So, head to keeps.com forward slash Simon or click the link in the description below for a special offer. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon. Thank you again to Keeps for sponsoring today's video. And now back to it. This had jump-started the city's economy, which had been left reeling up until this point from the decade-long Great Depression that preceded it. This had all turned Chicago into one of America. America's second largest metropolises, with over 4 million people residing there permanently. Yeah, there you go. What does he say? 3.5 plus half a minute? Chat GPT, you're so smart! Yet even as all of this was occurring, regular life marched on, as did crime and murder and death. Those things, unfortunately, are always lurking in the background of every story and in every time period, even the ones where most minds and eyes are focused on lands and conflicts an ocean away. Yeah, I bet they occur more. Like, I bet there's some sickos who are like, oh, there's a war going on. Like, you bet in Ukraine right now. Like, there's a big, big war going on there. Like, Russia getting up to You can bet that there's some people, like, on those border regions, like some sickos who are like, cool, no police, no one's paying attention. I'm going to murder my enemies. Or maybe just murder people for fun. I bet this happens all the time. And it's just because, you know, attention's just diverted elsewhere. I like to dissect girls. Did you know I'm utterly insane? 
On the morning of the 6th of June 1945, exactly one year to the day after the historic D-Day landings at Normandy, the body of a woman named Josephine Ross was discovered inside her north side apartment at 4108 North Kenmore Avenue. Josephine, who was 43 years old, was a thrice divorced mother of two daughters, Mary Jane and Jacqueline, all of whom lived together. Being thrice divorced in the 1940s has got to be pretty spicy, right? Like, being thrice divorced now. <laughs> Anyone who's been divorced three times, I'm like, just hoping number four is going to work out because I feel like there's people who get divorced once, people who get divorced maybe twice, and then there's people who get divorced like seven times. There's not a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, no, just in the middle, did three, fourth one worked out perfect. It's like, no, you just, you're just going to string them up. It's just going to be annoying. Just stop getting married. They all lived together. Jacqueline, uh, the mother and the daughters, that is. Jacqueline had been the one to find her mother's body when she returned home from work for lunch. She was also the one who had phoned the police. When authorities arrived at the woman's small flat to investigate, they found a crime scene that was truly bizarre. The first and most obvious peculiarity was that the apartment appeared to have been ransacked. Furniture was overturned. Dresser drawers had been pulled out and rifled through. Paper documents, newspapers, and magazines were thrown around the room haphazardly. It appeared as if someone had been frantically searching for something, yet nothing except some loose pocket change had been taken. Mm. Having done Casual Criminals for a while, my gut tells me that this is just someone trying to cover their tracks to make it look like a robbery or something else rather than just like straight up murder. Inside the bedroom, where Josephine's body lay, things got even stranger. Josephine was posed atop her blood-soaked bed. She had been stabbed multiple times in the neck with such force that the wall, ceiling, and curtains around her were covered in blood splatter. Yet her body, which was completely naked and uncovered, was clean and mostly free of blood, making it stand out starkly from the scene around it. Dude, this is, like, pretty f***ing weird. Did anyone else watch that TV show? It was, I don't know, it was, it was ages ago now. Um, Like, not 90s ages ago, but like, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe. They had... And it was about, I think it had Hannibal Lecter in it. And I stopped watching it because it got too gruesome. Like there was this dude who was going around killing people and then taking their ribs out and making them look like angels. Like turning their ribs in their back into wings. And it's just like, no, f*** this. I'm out. <laughs> now I do a true crime show. But that was too much for me. I was like, no, please, no. Her face had been wrapped tightly inside a red dress, giving her the appearance of a mummy from the neck up. As the police looked closer, they realized that Josephine had been bathed and her wounds had been bandaged post-mortem. The slashes across her neck had been closed using adhesive tape. In Josephine's bathroom, police noted that her bathtub was filled with bloody water and several bloody garments, all of which belonged to Josephine. This is ostensibly where she had been bathed after her death, but prior to being bandaged. Based on all of this, police estimated that Josephine had been attacked and killed inside her bedroom, dragged to the bathroom to be bathed, and then have her clothes removed, and then carried back to the bedroom to be posed. She had not, however, been sexually assaulted. Looking for evidence inside the apartment, the police came up largely empty-handed, as there was no foreign fingerprints to be found. Their only possible lead was a few dark hairs wrapped around Josephine's fingers that likely belonged to her attacker, but these were of little use, as DNA testing would not be possible for another 40 years. Yeah, this is like the black and white days. <laughs> They're like looking for fingerprints and sh**. The daughter, Jacqueline, was the first person that police questioned. This was done not only because she had been the one to discover her mother's body, but because the crime scene was so bizarre that the police believed it must have been staged. Well, I mean, obviously it's staged. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? It, she's got a dress wrapped around her face. They, like, used sellotape to close up her wounds in her neck. Of course it's staged. It's not like, oh yeah, no, I killed her, and then she magically got a dress wrapped around her and the, the wounds, like, taped up. They suspected that Josephine had likely been killed by someone she knew for personal reasons, and that everything in the apartment was a panicked cover-up to make the murder appear more complicated than it really was. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I mean, okay. Okay, I mean, so I said that the rifling through the, the house was, like, part of a cover-up. I agree. But, like, the staging of the... I didn't know about the staging of the body there. Which is like, that's really weird. That definitely throws a spanner in my theory. As stated, the only thing missing was some loose change. None of Josephine's jewelry or valuables had been stolen, despite the fact that they were located in a very noticeable location. That doesn't necessarily mean cover-up. It could mean that someone was looking for something specific. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe she was a spy. They were looking for some document or something. 
seems unlikely, but possible. Jacqueline told detectives that she and her sister had left the apartment for work earlier that morning at 9 a.m. and that their mother, who was currently unemployed, had decided to return to bed. She had received a psychic reading the previous day that informed her that her life was about to improve dramatically. Oh no, you see, psychics are always wrong. <laughs> I mean, they're not always wrong, but it's just a crapshoot. She had been so relieved that she had decided to take a day off for herself. Mary Jane corroborated Jacqueline's story, and both girls were cleared as suspects after passing polygraph tests. Adhering to the age-old rule of it's always the husband, they then turned to Josephine's love life. As it turns out, Josephine was a bit of a player. She had an ex-husband. <laughs> well, she had three ex-husbands, didn't she? Several boyfriends and one fiancé, Oscar Nordmark, to whom she'd recently gotten engaged. <laughs> Oscar's not gonna like it. She's got several boyfriends, Oscar. Did you know about them? All the men were questioned and later cleared. Oscar, the police felt, was the most likely suspect, but his alibi was airtight. Yeah, I'd be like, Oscar. He probably found out about those boyfriends. But he has an alibi. So... I mean, an airtight alibi, so we know it's not him. As for other witnesses, there were two. The building's custodian and another of the building's residents both stated that they'd seen a slender, dark-haired man in a light-colored sweater fleeing the building around the time of the murder. Neither man had been told about the hairs found in Josephine's hand, so the police believed that both men had likely seen the killer with their own eyes. Yet their description proved to be of little use in the long run. Feeling desperate, the police attempted to link the crime to another strange murder that had occurred two years earlier. In this one, a woman named Estelle Carey had been tied to a chair inside her apartment, tortured, and then set on fire. What the fuck, man? However, police eventually accepted that they were grasping at straws. Yeah, I mean, that does. It's a, hor it's a horrible crime as well. But this woman wasn't tortured, the, uh, the, the Jacqueline woman. And I, I, other than it being a horrif another horrific crime, that's, that's the only thing that seems to be tying these two things together. Not only were the crimes themselves completely different, exactly, but Estelle had been the boyfriend of a notorious Chicago mobster, Nick Dean, an associate of Al Capone. Well, I wonder why she got tortured and killed. By then, it was all but confirmed that her death had been a mob hit orchestrated as revenge for Estelle's cooperation with the police. Oh my god, she cooperated with the police against Al Capone? Or like a mate of Al Capone's? Bruh, <laughs> no wonder you got tortured and set on fire. Don't do that, it's a bad idea, it's Al Capone! He's like, it's Al Capone! What more needs to be said? Josephine was not associated with the mob in any way, so the connection was eventually dropped. After eight long weeks of fruitless investigation, the case went cold, as detectives announced that no progress had been made, but that they would continue searching for answers. They had no idea that this murder was the first of three that would eventually be attributed to a man that the media would dub the Lipstick Killer. The Lipstick Killer sounds like a Netflix docuseries. This sounds like one of those cases which you see, like, I don't know, Netflix loves pushing this to me they're like you want to watch this simon you sick i'm like yeah baby <laughs> chicago's jack the ripper approximately six months later on december the 11th 1944 as chicago's frigid winter temperatures had turned the city streets into a snowy ice-covered hellscape the chicago pd were called to an apartment at 3941 north pine grove avenue where another body had been discovered this apartment was located less than two blocks from Josephine's apartment, but this time the victim was 33-year-old Francis Brown, a factory worker and former telegrapher for the U.S. Navy Waves. Uh, Matthew has left me a note here. He says, Waves stands for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. It was the women's only branch of the U.S. Navy established in 1942 to fill positions within the Navy that were left vacant by the large numbers of sailors who were needed for World War II. This role was similar to the U.S. Army's. WAAC, Women Army, Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, and the WASP's Women's Air Force Service Pilots. These programs were some of the first that allowed women to officially serve in the US military. What a fun little aside, do I like that? I mean, I'm kind of known for, like, outside of this true crime channel, I mostly do, like, historical facts and stuff. And also on Decoding the Unknown, like, conspiracy theories. I mean, not conspiracy. I remember one review we got from Deco for Decoding the Unknown ages ago was like, Just another stupid paranormal channel. And I'm like, Bro, you never watched it. Like, we are the opposite. The only thing that is paranormal about it is the bloody name and the title of the episodes. And then all I do is shit on the paranormal. So did you even listen to the show, bro? The person who reported the body was Martha Engels, the building's housemaid. She had been drawn to Francis's unit by the sound of a radio, which she stated was turned up unusually loud for so early in the morning. Other tenants were complaining about the noise, so she had gone to investigate. This is when she had found Francis's drawer ajar, and inside noted that there was blood covering Francis's bed, the walls around it, and on the carpet leading to the bathroom. Concerned that Francis needed help. 
<laughs> what gave you that idea? Oh, I wonder if she needs some help. <laughs> What's all this blood? It's covering the walls. So she entered the unit and crept toward the bathroom. That's when she first discovered Frances's lifeless body stretched across the bathtub with a butcher's knife sticking out of the side of her neck. When the police arrived at the scene, they immediately connected Frances's death to Josephine's as the similarities between the two were obvious. Frances had been stabbed multiple times, her body had been washed post-mortem, several of her wounds had been crudely bandaged, and her face was wrapped like a mummy using either a towel or a pair of pajamas reports vary. Likewise, her apartment had been ransacked, yet nothing had been taken. There were, however, some differences. Unlike Jacqueline, Francis had also been shot in the head with a gun, and the killer had left something behind for the police. On the wall next to the blood-soaked bed, a message was written in lipstick, and it read, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. And included here is a little screenshot, a little image of it, and... For heaven's sake. And the person has terrible handwriting. That's all I'll say. It's barely readable. I'm not sure if that's because the person is dim or because it's the past. Although they don't use joined up handwriting, like cursive. Doesn't everyone in the past use cursive? He's also seemed to be using like random capital letters. So i don't know maybe a little bit dim reading the message the officers felt a chill run down their necks but as they found out to look for more evidence they found little the killer had taken the time to wipe away all his fingerprints as none were found on the knife the wall or near the body this spoke to the fact that the killer was meticulous careful and vigilant however his efforts were not perfect on the wall near the front door one partial print smudged in blood was discovered police believed that due to the angle of the prints the killer had left it as he exited the apartment this belief was later corroborated when the apartment's night clerk told detectives that he had witnessed a nervous-looking man exiting the elevator and shuffling out of the building's main entrance not long after another resident claimed to have heard a muffled gunshot at around 4 a.m. Wait, this is an apartment building? I feel like if you hear a gunshot, you're gonna... Like, I never... Like, I live in a... I, I recently moved, but I used to live in an apartment building. And even though it was, like, an old building, and those walls are goddamn thick, you never hear the neighbors, I feel like a gunshot you definitely hear. This man was described as being between the ages of 35 and 40 and weighing approximately 140 pounds. This was yet another similarity that tied Francis's death to Josephine's. Unfortunately, the clerk was not able to provide detectives with any further description. However, he did offer up one other piece of very useful information. He knew that the man was not a resident of the building, nor had he entered the building through its front door at any point in the night prior to the murder. This led detectives to speculate that the killer had entered Francis' apartment building through an open window, which was significant because this window was multiple stories above ground level. Aren't all American, like, I feel all American buildings have that giant, like, fire escape, metal fire escape running outside. Is that just New York? I feel like Chicago would have this as well. Right? Can't they just climb up that, like, fire escape thing? We don't have those in Europe. I don't know why. I think if there's a fire, generally, as far as I'm aware, the fire brigade come, and then they, like, lift you out of the window. Because the buildings are really old, and there's all, like, loads of concrete between the floors. So generally, there was a fire down the street on the building. That I, you'd never see house fires anymore. But an apartment was, like, fully burned out. But all of the apartments around it were completely fine. So... I don't know, maybe that's why we don't have, or maybe we're just like more willing to take the risk rather than have these like stairs constructed everywhere. Since there were no obvious signs that a ladder had been used on the ground below, police assumed that the killer was extraordinarily adept at climbing. Okay, so I guess there were no stairs. <laughs> Back upstairs inside the apartment, police examined Frances' body and, f and wounds more closely, noting that the killer had driven it into her neck with such force. What in? The blade. Oh, the knife's blade into her neck with such force that the knife's blade was protruding out the opposite side. F***ing hell. In the police's minds, this evidenced extreme passion, anger, hatred, and possibly lust. <laughs> it's like, ah oh, yes, I lust after you so much, therefore I must penetrate you. Thus I must penetrate your neck with this knife. What the f***? However, they were careful to note that, like Josephine before her, Francis did not appear to have been sexually assaulted either before or after the murder. The following morning, the city was abuzz when news of Francis' death finally began to spread. While Josephine Ross's murder had only been reported deep within a few newspapers and obituary columns primarily because her multiple divorces and secret boyfriends made her a less than savory person in the 1940s, Francis was a way more sympathetic character. The former Navy wave veteran and the bizarre note written in lipstick became front page 
stage news across the entire city. To sell more newspapers, the press dubbed the killer names like Chicago's Jack the Ripper and the Lipstick Killer, the latter of which would obviously stick. Well, so far, don't they know he only killed one person? It's like Jack the Ripper on the loose. It's like, it's just one murder. Some things never change, do they? Media. Feeling the media pressure, the Chicago police made investigating Francis's murder their top priority. They assigned several veteran detectives to the case, who each began rounding up anyone and everyone they could find that may have been in the area at the time of the murder. They paid especially close attention to any known sex offenders, spousal abusers, and drunks, dragging nearly 70 people in for questioning within the first few days. Sounds honestly like a pretty good place to start. Yet their efforts once again yielded no real results. Whoever this depraved killer of women was, he was smart enough to lay low, not make himself obvious to the police, and not kill again while the heat was turned up. Eventually, after exhausting nearly every lead, authorities changed course and made an unexpected announcement. Despite the description that had been provided to them by multiple witnesses, they announced that the killer was likely a woman. What, a man-sized woman? I mean, yeah, sure, man-sized women exist. But... It doesn't seem very likely. This was due to several notable facts. First, Francis's killer had chosen to use lipstick to write their message, even though there have been several other writing devices available to her inside the apartment. Second, the term, for heaven's sake, which had been used to start the message, was seen as a very effeminate phrase. And finally, even though Francis was described as a very handsome woman, she had not been sexually assaulted, which the police believed was not indicative of a man because no man depraved enough to kill in such a gruesome manner could have resisted taking advantage of the opportunity opportunity is that a thing <laughs> like is the person driven by a desire to kill also driven by a desire to sexually assault they f i feel like those could be very separate things honestly this reasoning sounds a bit shaky to me me too matthew but the police oh were getting more and more desperate the media was continuing to hound them not only for failing to solve these murders but for the city's extremely high crime rates abysmally low arrest rate and complete failure to crack down on mob activity Yet this avenue of investigation yielded no viable suspects once again. At one point, there were rumblings that authorities had someone in custody, but this unnamed person was later released and details about them have either been lost to time or were never made public in the first place. For now, the police and media had to simply wait and hope that someone with more information would come forward. However, as they waited, another crime would shake the city to its core just days after the start of the new year. The kidnapping of six-year-old girl Suzanne Degnan. The Kidnapping By the time 1945 was coming to a close, spirits in Chicago were on the rise. The war had officially ended in September, and by Christmas, approximately one million U.S. troops had been discharged and were beginning to arrive back home to the United States. Of those million, thousands had returned to their families in Chicago, and there was still more good news to come, as before the end of the year, the U.S. government announced that all troops eligible for demobilization would arrive home no later than February of 1946. Thus, the streets of Chicago were alive with activity and celebration, as for the first time since before the start of the Great Depression, the new year seemed bright and with promise of hope. However, for one family, that promise would be broken in the most heinous way imaginable. On the night of the 6th of January 1946, approximately one month since the murder of Francis Brown, James Degnan tucked his daughter into bed and kissed her goodnight, fully expecting, as every parent does, that she'd be waiting for him the following morning. However, when he and his wife, Helen, returned at dawn to wake up Suzanne for school, they found her bed empty. Across the room, the window stood open. Mm, don't like this! Immediately, James and Helen began searching the home. They checked in closets and under furniture, calling out to Suzanne, but receiving no response. They then contacted their upstairs neighbors, the Flynns, asking if she had wandered up there for any reason, but were told that she had not. They then called the police. Within minutes, officers from the Chicago PD arrived, and it wouldn't take them long to make a startling discovery. On the floor beside Suzanne's bed, what had first appeared to be a crumpled up tissue was revealed to be a hastily written ransom note that read, Get $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens. Burn this for her safety. Uh, this person cannot spell. <laughs> Just, uh, you can't see this. I mean, if you're watching the the video version of this show, then you'll probably see it on screen, but they cannot spell. James and Helen struggled to stay on their feet as all hope for an innocent explanation evaporated. They began to panic when they realized that in their haste to find Suzanne, they'd failed to notice the note and had accidentally disobeyed the kidnapper's orders. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, police from across the city then began congregating outside the Degnan residence in droves. That sounds like a real bad idea. 
you should be like, yo, police, we just found this note. Please don't make it obvious that you that we told you. Please, please. Okay, we'll be right there. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. They arrived in patrol cars packed with up to six officers each from various precincts to offer their assistance. They walked the neighborhood's icy streets, going door to door in the hopes that someone had noticed something suspicious the prior night. As this was happening, detectives continued to search the home from top to bottom. They had walked Suzanne to the bathroom at around midnight before James had put her to bed, after which time they both retired to their own bedroom at around 12.30 a.m. Neither had left the room until the following morning. At one point in the night, Helen said she thought she had heard someone shuffling about, but assumed that Suzanne had gotten up to go to the bathroom. The upstairs neighbor, Mary Flynn, and her husband, whose bedroom was directly over Suzanne's, claimed that they had heard noises and talking coming from below them at around 12.50. At that same time, they had heard their dogs barking outside. At first, they said they'd tried to ignore the dogs, but fearing that the barking would wake the Degnans, eventually they ventured down from upstairs to silence them sometime shortly after 1 a.m. They claimed that during this time, they didn't notice anything out of the ordinary inside or outside the home. Back inside Suzanne's bedroom, little evidence beside the ransom note had been discovered, but outside her window, detectives noted that there was an old ladder lying on the grounds near the home's garage. It was not directly below Suzanne's window, but when the ladder was stood upright, it was just tall enough for a man of average height to reach the windowsill above and climb inside. Because the Flins had not noticed whether or not the ladder had been propped up the prior night, police could not say for certain that this was how the kidnapper had entered the home. However, they considered it the most likely point of entry. When the police's efforts to interview the other neighbors also led them nowhere, they then spread out to canvas the neighborhood's back alleys. As they did, the Degnan's home rotary phone rang several times. James Helen and the police assumed that the caller was Suzanne's abductor, reaching out to provide further instructions as promised, but they couldn't be sure because the line would disconnect immediately after someone answered. The caller was either losing their nerve before speaking, or they were taunting them. Police couldn't be sure of which. As they waited for the caller to phone again, all the police and the Degnans could do was sit, wait, and hope that the officers putting in the real legwork outside would stumble upon something. They also hoped that the kidnapper might release Suzanne on their own once they realized just how much trouble they were in, but the longer everyone waited, the less likely this outcome seemed. Eventually, all hope would be lost when another call was received by Chicago PD dispatch, pushing the investigation in a much more sinister direction. In this call, an anonymous man ominously suggested that the police should begin searching the sewers surrounding the Degnan's home. The caller did not leave his name, and the call could not be traced. Seeing as it was now nearly 7 p.m. and the fleeting winter sun had already begun to set, officers paired up into teams and ventured out on foot to walk the alleyways once again. It didn't take long for one of the teams to notice that the lid to a catch basin had recently been disturbed. As they approached it, two officers lifted the heavy steel cover as another shined his flashlight down into the sewer below. There, among the muck, he spotted Suzanne's bright blonde hair shining. Moving the beam of light further down, he saw her face, but there was nothing more. It was only her head. Unfortunately, despite what the note had claimed, no kidnapping had occurred. Susan had been dead the entire time, since long before her parents had awoken to find her missing. Within the next few days, the child's torso and severed legs would be discovered in two separate sewers nearby. Police did not, however, immediately find her arms. Those would not be located for another several weeks. By then, the rest of Suzanne's body would be buried. The Facts of the Case now, if you thought the police's response to Suzanne's kidnapping was already large, be aware that you haven't seen anything yet. Once it was confirmed that the little blonde girl everyone was searching for had been murdered in such a brutal fashion, authorities knew that her name and photo would be front-page news by no later than the following morning. They were desperate to find something to prove they weren't just sitting on their hands. So far, all they had were a few reports of bumps in the night, a ransom note, and a whole lot of speculation. So hundreds of officers poured into the area to participate in what would become one of the largest manhunts in Chicago's history. They didn't have a clue who they were searching for, but they knew that somebody, somewhere, must have seen or heard something. Fortunately, it wouldn't take long for them to round up several potential suspects. However, before we speak about them, let's talk about what the police knew, what they didn't know, and what they strongly suspected. This will be very important as we move forward, because as the title of this script suggests, there is much reason to believe that the person the police would ultimately charge with Suzanne's murder, as well as the murders of Josephine Ross and Francis Brown, may have been innocent. I'll give you the facts so that you can decide for yourselves. Now, let's begin with what else was discovered on the night of January 7th. In the basement of a building near the catch basin where officers located Suzanne's head, police stumbled upon a room that the media would soon refer to as the murder room. 
That name was a bit of a misnomer for reasons that we'll get into in just a moment, but let's first discuss what was found inside this room. At first glance, the basement appeared normal, but inside a wash basin in the room's center, police recovered several tiny pieces of human flesh. Near this wash basin, at the bottom of a coal bin used to stoke the building's furnace, a large blood stain was found with fresh coal scooped over top it in a way that was meant to disguise the stain. The stain was relatively fresh, and police soon declared that they were standing exactly where Suzanne had been dismembered less than 24 hours earlier. However, they were hesitant to declare that she had been killed there because they didn't want to rule out the possibility that an undiscovered third location may exist nearby. As for what was not in the room, there were no tools, no saws, no knives. There was also there were also no fingerprints, as it appeared that in addition to hiding the bloodstains, the killer had thoroughly cleaned the room sometime after dismembering and disposing of the body, indicating to police that they were entirely comfortable inside that room. Understanding that acquiring a full timeline of the night Susan disappeared might be the most important step in solving a murder, detectives then set out to interview as many people as possible. Upstairs, residents of the building were all thoroughly questioned, and many reported hearing loud and unusual noises coming from below sometime between 3 and 4 a.m., they also reported hearing running water in the building at around 2.30 a.m., when according to them, no reasonable person should have been awake. None of the residents took responsibility for making the noises or running the water, so the police assumed the killer had been dismembering Suzanne between 2.30 and 4 a.m. To further fill the timeline, they then turned to the coroner, who examined Suzanne's body. He stated that, based on the contents of her stomach, she had likely died somewhere between 12 and 1 a.m., further fueling speculation that she had been killed prior to being transported to the murder room. The coroner also believed that the body, like Josephine and Francis before her, had been washed prior to dismemberment. When speaking to other witnesses, a furloughed soldier named George E. Subgrunsky claimed to have seen a man in a trench coat and a fedora walking to the Degnan's home shortly after midnight on the night of the murder. He said that the man was 5'9", 170 pounds, and had been carrying a shopping bag. However, he was unable to provide a description of the man's face because he hadn't seen it. After this, no witnesses came forward. And the only other abnormality that the police suspected may have been relevant was a home burglary that had occurred a single block from the Degnan's home on the night before Suzanne's murder. This home's occupant, a veteran named Harry Gold, owned several pieces of Nazi memorabilia that he had collected from dead German soldiers during the war. These items had been stolen during the burglary, but police were once again unable to track down any suspects. So, to recap and summarize everything that they had learned, the police knew that Suzanne had been put to bed at around midnight, that the killer had likely entered her room less than 30 minutes after her parents had gone to bed, that he had killed and transported her to the murder room to begin dismembering her by no later than 2.30, and he had dumped her body before sunrise. That last part was an assumption, but the police felt comfortable stating it as a fact because the dump sites were not in secluded locations, meaning that the killer would have surely been spotted if it attempted to dump the body after sunrise. All this information together meant that the killer worked fast and was proficient. In less than six hours, he had done everything previously mentioned while also managing to return and clean the basement without being noticed. This dude has definitely done this before. That's, like, for sure. This became even more impressive when the coroner revealed the cuts on Suzanne's body were clean and showed absolutely no signs of hacking. Up until this point, Police were already considering the possibility that the killer was a surgeon of some sort, but the coroner blew this theory out of the water when he went on to declare that the killer was either a man who had worked in a profession that required the study of anatomy or one with a background in dissection. Not even the average doctor could be as skillful. It had to be a meat cutter. Consequently, police then began looking into Chicago's many local meat packers, and that's when something else happened that further confirmed their new theory. A few days after the murder, Chicago's mayor, Edward Kelly, received the following letter in the mail. This is to tell you how sorry I am not to get old Degnan instead of his girl. Roosevelt and the OPA made their own laws. Why shouldn't I? And a lot more. What does that mean? This must be some past thing. To understand this, let's slow down a moment and talk about the OPA. The Office of Price Administration had been established four years earlier in 1941 by President Franklin D. Roosevelt via an executive order. The agency's job was to enact price controls to limit the cost of goods during the war so that inflation would not devour the economy and to place rations on critical supplies to prevent hoarding and scalping. It was an emergency measure, and within its first two years of operation, the agency had placed controls on everything from sugar and coffee to automobiles and housing. At its peak, it had locked in the prices of over 90% of grocery store items. Depending on who you ask, this may have saved countless Americans from bankruptcy, but towards the end of the war, the agency's popularity in Washington, D.C. took a nosedive. One of the unintended and unfortunate consequences of the OPA's price controls was the emergence of black markets for various food and supplies. 
The mob was famously involved in many of these black markets, all of which hurt local workers because black market goods often circumvented the local unions. In 1946, tensions between unions and their employers were already at an all-time high due to several strikes over low wages. One of the unions that were striking was the Packing House Workers Organizing Committee, aka the Meatpacks Union. Because there were also talks of OPA further cracking down on dairy product prices, a series of violent threats had been made against OPA executives, with one member feeling forced to surround himself and his family with armed guards after a direct threat was made against his children. This is extremely suspicious. Like, it's definitely some un unhappy meatpacking dude. James Degnan was also a senior executive for the OPA. God damn. This is it. This is like... This is the motivation. Now with more context, let's reread that letter. This is to tell you how sorry I am not to get old Degnan instead of his girl. Roosevelt and the OPA made their own laws, why shouldn't I? And a lot more. After this, many within the Chicago PD began to believe wholeheartedly that Suzanne's killer was a local meatpacker. The motivation was there, as was the skill. Plus, violence by union meatpackers was not unheard of, as just weeks before Suzanne's murder, a black market meat seller had been decapitated in the streets for being a scab. This man's killer had not been caught, nor would he ever be. A scab, someone who, like, um, goes against the union, right? This man's killer had not been caught, nor would he ever be. However, others were not as convinced because of speculation that the letter may have been faked by someone attempting to damage the reputation of the Meatpackers Union. Was that a fake? Well, nobody can say for sure, but if you attempted to dismiss this theory because it sounds too outlandish, I strongly encourage you to research the history of union busting. It won't take you very long, and you'll find countless examples of wealthy employers hiring shady figures to paint union members as immoral communists seeking to undermine the American way of life. Yeah, this was a huge thing back in the day. Either way, as you can tell, this was a very confusing time for everyone involved with the investigation, and even after everything the police had learned, the only piece of real, tangible evidence that they had found was the kidnapping note. But that note brought with it many more questions than answers. Had the killer written it before he arrived, or writing it been a last-minute decision while in the room with Suzanne? Had the kidnapping been a ruse from the start, or had the killer genuinely intended to keep her alive and something had gone wrong? If so, how was he so well prepared to dismember and dispose of her body? Had he done this before? If so, why had he gone to such lengths to hide her body if he intended to lead the police to her remains anyway? Was that always the plan? Or did he feel remorse for his actions after the fact? Um, I think he just sounds a little bit mad, right? Like, the reason this doesn't make sense is because his brain doesn't make sense. Furthermore, police still couldn't say for certain where Suzanne had been killed or how the killer had entered the Degnans. Suzanne's window showed no signs of forced entry, and the ladder theory wasn't all that convincing in hindsight. If the killer had used the ladder beside the garage to reach her windowsill, why had he taken the time to lower and place it back where it belonged next to the garage? Was Suzanne alive while he was doing this? If so, how did he keep control of her while focusing his attention on the ladder? To the police, nothing about this case made logical sense, and the pointless brutality of it was baffling. Yet the public and media were relentless in their demand for justice. On January 24th, two weeks after Suzanne's murder, 400 people gathered outside a local elementary school to protest the police's lack of progress. I mean, they really are trying, though, aren't they? This was a huge group. They're assigning all these veteran detectives. It's not like they're like, ah, whatever, you know, yeah, they die all the time. Kids are dismembered and kidnapped all the time. No, that's not what's happening. The police seem to really be doing their job. The media's coverage of this event was brutal, as was the coverage over the next three months, during which time 60 separate articles were published by the Chicago Tribune alone. Of these, at least eight featured Suzanne on the front page. They refused to let the story fade into the background of public consciousness, and this pressure, some have argued, is what caused the police to make so many mistakes along the way. A series of slapdash arrests. I mean, to this point, you might be thinking that the police have been doing an excellent job overall with the investigation, and I can't say I blame you considering the information I provided. Exactly, Matt. That's exactly what I'm saying. The police are really working on this, aren't they? <laughs> I get the feeling they might not be. In fact, on paper, the investigation seems incredibly thorough. To quote Lucy Freeman, author of Before I Kill More, the 1955 true crime book written about Suzanne's kidnapping and murder, quote, The police worked around the clock, often driving their own cars and using their own time. They worked day and night questioning suspects. They interviewed more than 800 persons suspected of the crime, gave lie detector tests to 170. The crime laboratory compared 7,000 sets of handwriting with a ransom note. A total of 5,250 tips were received from all over the world, offering clues or theories. 3,153 
were investigated. However, the tactics the police used throughout these interviews and interrogations left much to be desired. Infamously, the Chicago PD in those days was corrupt as all hell, and their reputation for violence against those in their custody was unparalleled. I mean, yes, okay, but I think in this case, there, you know, doesn't matter how corrupt you are, you're probably going to want to catch the dude who's killing children. One of the first real suspects the police homed in on was a 65-year-old Belgian immigrant named Hector Verger. Out of all the people they'd interviewed, detectives felt that Hector was their best suspect because he worked as a janitor in the Winthrop Street apartment building where Suzanne's body had been dismembered. He and his wife lived in an apartment directly across the street from the Degnan's home. Police theorized that Hector would have easily been able to watch Suzanne through a window and would have felt right at home inside the murder room as it was one of the rooms he was charged with cleaning and maintaining daily. They also recognized that the ransom note had multiple misspellings and had been covered in dirt, two things that pointed towards a poorly educated man with dirty hands. Although there was no physical evidence directly linking Hector to the crime and he had no prior criminal record, police felt they had enough to warrant an arrest. Really? This doesn't seem like your guy. They picked Hector up, transported him downtown, and beat him severely for 48 hours, and he had to be hospitalized for a full 10 days for not refusing to confess to the murders. Of his time in custody, Hector said, They hanged me up. They blindfolded me. I can't put up my arms. They are sore. They had handcuffs on me for hours and hours. They threw me in a cell and blindfolded me. They handcuffed my hands behind my back and pulled me up on bars until my toes touched the floor. I know eat. I go to the hospital. Oh, I am so sick. Any more, and I would have confessed to anything. Yeah, this is why torture isn't super effective for confessions, because people will confess to anything to make the torture stop. While in hospital, Hector was diagnosed with some very serious bruising and a dislocated shoulder, yet the police were still not finished with him. They kept pressuring Hector relentlessly, even going as far as to pressure his wife into confessing on Hector's behalf by threatening to arrest her as well as an accomplice. As if this wasn't bad enough, they also announced to the public early in the investigation that Hector was Suzanne's murderer. They didn't say that they'd made an arrest or that they suspected who had killed her. They stated, this is the man. It's a fact. Soon, Hector's name was front page news right alongside Suzanne's, and he wasn't released from custody until his janitor's union began fighting the arrest in court. They filed a writ of habeas corpus on Hector's behalf and pointed out that as a Belgian immigrant, he couldn't even write in English, meaning that it would have been impossible for the police's accusations to be true. After this, the police were then forced to make a statement declaring Hector's innocence. Yet the damage to his and his wife's reputation was already done. Years later, however, Hector and his wife would have the last laugh when the union helped them file a lawsuit against the Chicago PD for police brutality. Excellent! And also, like, pretty major defamation. They asked for $15,000, $252,000 adjusted for inflation, but the judge felt that Hector had been treated so grievously that he awarded $20,000 or $337,000 today instead. Good. The next unfortunate sob that fell into the ham fist of Chicago PD's radar was a man named Sidney Sherman. Sidney was a recently discharged veteran that fought overseas in the Second World War and had returned to Chicago during the first rounds of military discharges mere weeks before the murder. The police suspected Sidney for one reason. The back alley behind the Degnan's home contained a piece of wire and a handkerchief with the name S. Sherman embroidered on it. Officers theorized that these items could have been used as a garret and a gag for Suzanne during the kidnapping. Sidney Sherman's name was discovered when police rang S. Sherman through the military's personnel database. There was nothing else connecting him to the crime, yet police wasted no time in obtaining an arrest warrant. I mean, S. Sherman is... There's, there's, how many people? Four million people in Chicago? <laughs> it's going to be more than one S. Sherman. It's not exactly an uncommon name. When they arrived at the YMCA where Sidney was supposed to be living, however, they learned that he had left Chicago in a rush just days earlier. He had not even notified his employer that he was leaving, further cementing the police's belief that he was the killer. Now that is a bit more suspicious. I mean, it's not... It's, it's not a bad lead. I, I mean, I guess, like, it should be just like, okay, let's look into all people called S. Sherman. And then they find this guy skips town. Hmm, I'd look into that a bit more, I would think. This was not a completely unreasonable assumption to make, but the police's handling of Sidney's search was far from perfect. His name was released to the Chicago public in a statement where the police once again definitively stated that he was the killer, which caused a nationwide manhunt that lasted for over four days. Sidney was eventually located and arrested in Toledo, Idaho, but upon being interrogated, it became clear almost immediately that he was innocent. He had an alibi for the night of the murder, and his sudden departure from Chicago was not nearly as suspicious as the police first believed. He had eloped with his new girlfriend that he had met after returning from the war. They'd moved to Ohio to start a new life together. 
After being cleared by multiple polygraph tests, Sidney was released when it was determined that the handkerchief didn't even belong to him. The S. Sherman stood for Seymour Sherman, a resident of New York City, who the police then shifted their focus to. Not after saying, This is the guy! He is definitely the murderer of a child! He cut a child's head off! If this was internet days, you'd have ruined this guy's life. Because that that the correction would just not be as interesting as the accusation. However, they were forced to drop him as well when it became clear that Seymour's alibi was also airtight. He hadn't even been in the country in January of 1945. After this series of blunders, the police were then forced to announce that neither Sidney Sherman nor Seymour Sherman were Suzanne's killers, further eroding the public's trust and making them look like incompetent buffoons. Yes, I wonder why they would think that. <laughs> Maybe because of all the incompetence. They also determined that the handkerchief and wire were likely irrelevant to the case, which is why I had not mentioned them up until this point. The cycle of arrest, declaration of guilt, and release continued for several more months, as multiple other suspects, each one less viable than the last, were arrested and beaten, until they either managed to convince the police of their innocence or had to be hospitalized. The reason the police were doing this, many have speculated, was out of pure desperation, because the city's election season was fast approaching. The perfect suspect. On the afternoon of June 26, 1946, police were dispatched to a residence on Farwell Avenue after receiving reports that a young man was on the run after being caught burglarizing a nearby apartment building in broad daylight. It's not very bright, is it? This young man's name was William Hirons, and he was a 17-year-old college student on summer break after his freshman year at the University of Chicago. He was also a known burglar with a juvenile record. Earlier that day, William had traveled north from his dormitory at U of C to sell one of two saving bonds that he kept tucked inside his wallet that were valued at $500 each. Not a small amount of money in those days. God damn. Did he say two? He's got $1,000 just in his wallet? That would be insane today. This is the 1940s. What's that? That's going to be like ten thousand dollars or something nuts he was selling one because he was strapped for cash and had a date that afternoon however when he arrived at the post office at around 3 p.m he found that it had closed earlier than expected as it sometimes did during the hot summer months there's nothing more irritating than that when it's just like oh yeah closed and often it was like closed for technical reasons and you're like there's no technical reasons it's just hot <laughs> and you just wanted to go home early and i traipsed all the way out here to get my letter and you all went home early Frustrated, William had chosen to burglarize the Wayne Manor Apartments <laughs> Wayne Manor Apartments, really, at 6928 North Wayne Avenue to steal just enough to hold him over until the following day. He chose these apartments because he knew the building's layout well. This was by no means the first time he'd chosen to burglarize it, and he assumed an unlocked door would make for a quick and easy job. As he walked up and down the building's third floor, he noticed a door was standing ajar to allow a breeze to lessen the afternoon heat. Wait you're going to burglarize an occupied apartment in the day. What are you up to? <laughs> when he looked inside the entry, he saw a wallet lying on the table just within reach. He grabbed it, but as he did, a neighbor threw open his front door, spotted William, and a confrontation ensued. <laughs> I made a terrible mistake. Yeah, not a terrible mistake. Nothing happens. <laughs> but I was at home for the weekend, and I'd left my car parked on the street because... Uh, right now uh, uh, we we have a garage but it's been demolished and they're building like a new garage because the last garage was a piece of shit. um and so i had to park my car on the street so my wife could drive her car out of our driveway and i just parked my car left it on the street and i left the key in on the passenger seat on the front passenger seat i left the car there for three days and this is a car that people would definitely steal and i just came back to it on monday and it's still there car that just the, and also expensive pair of sunglasses just sitting on the passenger seat along with a key just in the car and i'm like wow i live in a safe neighborhood no one stole this he grabbed it but as he did a neighbor threw open his front door spotted william and a confrontation ensued the neighbor chased william out of the unit and back down the stairs to the first floor as this was happening the neighbor's wife had called down the, to the building's front desk to make them aware of what was going on when william reached the lobby he was confronted by the building's custodian francis hanley who purposefully placed him between himself between william and the front door holding his arms out wide and waiting to catch him Still being hotly pursued by the neighbor, William pulled a small revolver from his pocket, pointed at the man, and yelled, Let me out, or I'll let you have it in the guts. Oh my god, you'd just be like, Okay, <laughs> carry on, you may go. I am not going to die today, thank you very much. Seeing the gun, the janitor stepped aside and allowed William to pass by. He watched as the boy took off down the street, and then he phoned the police. Although you have just massively escalated your crime. You've gone from, is this going from burglary to robbery? Because you've committed a violent act? while stealing something 
Is that how robbery works? Upon exiting the Wayne Manor Hotel, William fled down the street on foot and ducked into an alley between two residential buildings on Farwell Avenue. He then scaled the exterior wooden fire escape of 1320 W Farwell and hid himself on the building's roof in a way that gave him an unobstructed view of the alleyway and the street below. He intended to stay there until the heat died down. However, one of the building's residents, a woman named Mrs. Willett, had spotted William climbing a fire escape. She recognized that the boy was running and attempting to hide from someone and assumed that he was in some sort of trouble. She called the police as well. Soon, two officers from Chicago PD were on the scene. Their names were Officer Constant Tiffin and Officer William Owens. They parked their patrol car at the end of the alley with the lights on and proceeded on foot toward the building. There were two ways up to the roof, so the officers split up, each taking a separate route to effectively block William's only means of escape. From above, William spotted the officers' approach and attempted to flee back down the fire escape, but Officer Tiffin was too quick for him. He was already ascending the staircase, leaving William to frantically begin searching for another way down. Finding none, William pulled the revolver from his pocket in an act of desperation and pointed it at Tiffin. Oh my god, you're again escalating your crimes, and he's seen your face, and he's a cop shouting at him to stay back the same way that he'd done a short time earlier with the doorman seeing the revolver tiffin ducked out of sight and drew his own gun he then leaned out and fired a single shot at william missing him he then ducked back to safety intending to rush past the officer and flee deeper into the alley william took the opportunity to dart down the staircase believing that tiffin would not shoot him in the back in this william was correct i mean fair enough you don't want to shoot some guys fleeing however as he passed tiffin the man reached out and took a hold of william's clothes dragging him to the ground <laughs> can you imagine just sticks his leg out and trips him up it's like ah silly as the two struggled in vain to overpower one another an off-duty patrolman named abner cunningham happened to overhear the commotion from the street and decided to intervene seeing the gun in william's hand cunningham grabbed a clay flower plot from a nearby porch raised it high in the air and brought it down hard on william's head legend the pot cracked and William's limp body dropped to the ground. The last thing William remembered before blacking out was the officer standing over him. He had no idea that in less than a week's time, every man, woman, and child in the city would know and despise his name. Oh no, they're going to link him to this crime, aren't they? That's of course what we're talking about. Why, why, would I, why else would we be talking about some random robbery if it wasn't for this linked to the crime somehow? Although really? Little Billy Hirons. Little William Hirons was born to parents George and Margaret Hirons on November 15, 1928, just one year before the start of the Great Depression. As such, he and his brother Jerry, who was born three years later, had grown up poor as George was unable to find regular employment for many years. He worked as a day laborer when odd jobs were available, but never earned enough to ward off the financial strain that was always looming over the family's head. Margaret eventually found work at a bakery, but this was still not enough. When William was a child, George and Margaret fought often over money, yet despite this, William was obviously a bright boy. In his spare time, he would sketch crude designs for planes and boats, and those designs were described as advanced for his age. He didn't focus on the things that other boys typically would, like guns and other artillery. He focused on the shape of the plane's wings, trying to determine what made them fly. Over time, flight became an obsession for the boy, and one day Margaret returned home to find her son perched atop the garage roof with a pair of floppy cardboard wings strapped to his arms. Uh-oh. He was preparing himself to take flight when Margaret screamed at him to come down. How old was he? <laughs> when did kids learn not to do this? Beyond this, William was also a tinkerer who liked to take things apart and see how they worked. He would then challenge himself to reassemble them. Sometimes he was able to, but the family once went without a clock for several days because William's curiosity was so overzealous. However, as William and his brother grew older and the depression worsened, George and Margaret's money troubles became even more severe. And so did their constant bickering. Now, instead of attempting to hide their anger from their children, they began arguing bitterly for hours each night. They would scream at one another, and William would claim that those arguments drove him to a breaking point. He claims that he took to the streets to find some reprieve. He didn't have anything to do out there, but he would spend hours each evening walking alone, avoiding returning home for as long as possible. Years later, William would remark, Jerry seemed to be able to cope with it. I couldn't. Eventually, when he was about 12 years old, William saw an opportunity for him to fill his spare time in the afternoons while also earning a little money for himself. He took a job as a delivery boy for a local grocery store. Working in this role, he transported bags of groceries on foot to nearby apartments, took a payment for these groceries, and then returned to the store to deliver the money. However, it was while performing this job that William's real troubles would first begin. William claims that his first brush with theft occurred while he was making deliveries one morning after he was shortchanged a dollar by a customer. In those days, when everyone was pinching pennies to afford bread, a missing dollar was more than enough to see him fired, possibly arrested. 
Fearing this, William claims he saw an opportunity to make up for that lost dollar as he was dropping off his next delivery. As he unpacked the groceries at his next stop, he noticed several dollar bills lying unguarded on the counter nearby. He looked over his shoulder, saw the customer was out of sight, and quickly grabbed one of the bills, slipping it into his pocket and praying that he had not been spotted. With his heart galloping and sweat pouring down his face, William finished unloading the groceries, thanked the customer, took payment, and then exited the home. He had not been spotted. Outside, he says that he wanted to hide and vomit out of shame, but he also says he felt something rising above that emotion, gleeful satisfaction. William was a kleptomaniac and had just experienced his first high from stealing. Yeah, I guess it's, it's got to be exciting, right? You're like, ah. After this elation wore off, William said he continued to feel immense guilt for what he'd done, even though he was never caught. Yet the more time that passed after the initial theft, the more eager William became to do it again. Still avoiding home because his parents were still constantly fighting, William's innocent evening walks morphed into something more sinister. Now he began looking for opportunities to relive that rush, and he soon started swiping things for the pure enjoyment of it. In the summer months, William would primarily target large apartment buildings by ringing the front door's buzzer until someone answered. He would claim that he was there on a delivery. Sometimes this was true, but on days when he'd been on the hunt for things to steal, it wasn't. When nobody would answer the buzzer, he would sneak. <laughs> what are they going to do when someone does answer the buzzer? And it's like, well, okay, where are the groceries at? <laughs> it's going to be like, oh no, there wasn't any delivery. I was just looking to nick some. <laughs> when nobody would answer the buzzer, he would sneak around to the back alley and try the back door, which was usually unlocked. Once inside, William would make his way up and down the halls, and because air conditioning didn't exist yet, most residents left their front doors and windows open to create a breeze. This presented many opportunities for the boy. On days when William couldn't get inside through any of the building's traditional entrances, he would instead scale their exteriors, sometimes using a fire escape, but oftentimes climbing fences, clambering up stoneworks, and hoisting himself atop other architectural features to reach an open balcony door or a window above him. Most criminals would never attempt the type of dangerous feats that he performed, but William seemingly had no fear. Like he had been years earlier, when perched atop his family's garage pretending to take flight with cardboard wings, William was completely unafraid of heights. Earl R. Downs, one of the police officers charged with investigating the string of burglarized homes that young William left behind, would later say, That kid was like a monkey. Back in 42, he used a narrow board to span a five-foot area away from a third floor porch to reach a third floor bathroom window at 837 Bell Plain. He crawled across the narrow board while 30 feet below him was a cement sidewalk. Death if he fell. The same holds true for the time he lowered himself over a roof to a third floor apartment at 3933 Pine Grove, something like a human fly. Or the time he climbed up a wire mesh covered English basement window to grab the window ledge and pull himself up onto the first floor apartment at 3744 Pine Grove. How he got a foothold in the wire meshing is beyond imagination. The items that he's like some OG parkour dude. <laughs> the items that William stole were completely random, and most of them were no use to him. William was a kleptomaniac in the truest sense of the word. He didn't steal because he needed the money, even though he and his family still did. He stole purely for the rush. He took purses and mink coats, belts and suit jackets, cameras and radios, cooking utensils, and other miscellaneous valuables like watches and jewelry. However, he rarely sold any of them. He instead stashed everything inside a rooftop shed near his parents' apartment where he could easily visit them. He enjoyed looking at his collection and walked through the overflowing shed like he was at a museum. However, there was one item that William did often target specifically because he liked them, and that was guns. As a tinkerer, guns were particularly interesting for William. Not only did holding a gun fill him with a sense of power and control, but he also viewed them as a mechanical marvel worthy of study. Like his parents' clock, William loved to disassemble his father's unloaded handguns and rifles to study the parts and learn how they operated. Yeah, I mean, guns, it's fascinating out there. I find, like, clocks and guns, it's, you know, these mechanical things that are just, like, all these intricate parts working together to, to achieve an overall aim. I'm like... I find that stuff pretty interesting, I get it. He made sketches of the guns, designing his own custom ones that people would later say could have been perfectly functional. He even jotted down ideas for several improvements to some existing guns. He undoubtedly had a bright future ahead of him, but that future was forever changed when he made one critical mistake. At only 13, William was arrested for the first time when a Chicago PD officer noticed him acting suspiciously in a park. It's not clear exactly what this officer saw William do, but it was enough to make him detain the boy and frisk him. This is when he found a 25 caliber automatic pistol hidden away in William's clothing. Panicked, William insisted that he had merely found the gun abandoned on a nearby street corner and did not intend to use it, but the officer did not believe him. Yeah, it's a pretty weak excuse, my dude. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 I just found it just now. That's why I've got a gun on me. I just found it just now. Come on now. 
He transported William to the local lockup and proceeded to interrogate him. This is when William admitted that the gun had been stolen. The terrified 13-year-old boy then went on to admit to at least 11 separate burglaries and directed the police to his rooftop collection so that the items could all be returned. After this, William was declared a young delinquent and held in custody for three weeks, after which time he was brought before a judge in juvenile court. The judge sentenced William to one year inside the Gebot School for Wayward Boys, a Catholic reformatory school in Terre Haute, Air, Indiana, that claimed to specialize in rehabilitating young men who were raised in broken homes. If the name of that school sounds familiar, that's because it was the same school that Charles Manson attended in 1947. Wow, these guys have got their Illuminati! Although William and Manson missed one another by at least seven years. While enrolled at Gibalt, William lived under constant supervision from staff members who would deal out corporal punishment for the slightest infraction. Needless to say, there was little opportunity for William to act out in any meaningful way, so he was released in June of the following year without incident. However, he'd not be free for long, as his kleptomaniacal urges returned just as soon as he arrived back home. Of this time, William said, I wasn't even tempted. Then I would go home, and the tensions would build, and I would find myself burglarizing to ease them. He's addicted to stealing. Fascinating. This time, William was arrested after being caught slipping into guest rooms inside the Rogers Park Hotel, a fully furnished nine-story hotel and apartment building that provided rooms to both overnight guests and year-round tenants. In William's possession, officers discovered stolen property and a copied key of yet another hotel down the street. After being booked into jail yet again, William was taken to an interrogation room where an officer questioned him about how he'd gotten the key. The officer told William that he would not be in too much trouble if he told him everything. However, tensions escalated when William refused to talk. <laughs> Just tell me everything, son. That'll make it easier for you. The only response to that question should be lawyer. Lawyer, 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 lawyer. Despite the fact that William was still a teenager, the officer laid hands on the boy, beating him severely, both for the repeated thefts and for refusing to talk. It doesn't matter if he's a boy or an adult, that's still not okay. When Margaret later asked William what had happened to him inside the jail, William told her, It was the punishment I deserved. When brought before a judge for the second time, William was ordered to return to a reformatory school. However, this time he was sent to St. Bede's Academy in Peru, Illinois. Here, he fared much better than expected. While it had always been obvious to those that knew him, William now had the opportunity to prove just how smart he was. He excelled at St. Bede's, achieving higher than average marks and drawing the attention of the school's headmaster. At his recommendation, William applied to the University of Chicago, and because his grades were so impressive, he was permitted to skip his senior year and immediately enroll in classes for the 1945 fall semester. I was wondering earlier why he he finished his freshman year at 17 years old, which I thought maybe was just because of the times, you know, back in the day people got started with stuff younger. He was only 16 years old during his freshman orientation. That summer, William moved into Gates Hall and embarked on his journey toward becoming an engineer. He passed his classes easily, while also working several hours each week as an usher at the downtown orchestra hall. At night, William and his roommate, a boy named Joe Costello, would stay up talking about life and discussing philosophy, another of William's interests that he'd discovered at UFC. This guy doesn't seem like a murderer. If we're looking to pin the murder of the girl on this guy, this seems like such a stretch. In his sophomore year, William started dating a young woman who had one of the most unfortunate names that I've ever read, Joanne Slammer. <laughs> it was while courting Joanne that he would revert to his old habits to make ends meet. He stole anything he could get his hands on from nearby apartment buildings, and this is how he saved up enough money to afford the two $500 saving bonds that were found in his wallet after his third and final arrest in the summer of 1946. Marked. When William awoke in the hospital, he found that his hands were bound and that he was strapped to his hospital bed. His head hurt from the flower pot that had been used to incapacitate him and he could barely see straight. Around him, doctors and nurses performed tests before ultimately announcing that his skull had been fractured. He would, they said, need to rest up to prevent any permanent damage, but officers from the Chicago PD had no intention of allowing that to happen. Does it matter? Surely the doctors get the primary say here. I know this is the past and that the Chicago PD seem like right pieces of incompetent pieces of but surely if the doctor's like he has to rest two weeks i don't care if he's murdered 700 people he still has to rest and then you can have your way with him what follows in this chapter is a summary of william's own account of his time in custody and while i would not normally rely solely on the world of a potential murderer i think you'll find that his claims are well within the realm of possibility considering everything we already know about the chicago pd yeah the chicago pd twice already were like this is the guy it's a fact no wait a second not that guy no it's this guy that's a oh wait no not that guy <laughs> 
Come on, Chicago PD, do better. According to William, he was tortured for six days straight while in hospital, during which time officers did not allow him to sleep and withheld both food and water. He said that groups of officers would come into his room, surround his bed, and begin questioning him. They would not tell him where, what he was being charged with, nor would they allow him to see either his parents or a lawyer, despite him still legally being a minor. That's f***ed up. He needs that lawyer. It was during this questioning that he first learned of his suspected involvement in Suzanne's killing when one of the officers asked him why he liked to chop up little girls. You'd be like, in that house little bed as a thief, and you'd be like, ah, oh, yeah, no, I steal. Yeah, no, you know. You, what? No! <laughs> no, 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 not me. What? No, I'm a, I steal sh when William attempted to claim innocence, he said that the officers would become irate and begin verbally and physically abusing him. This treatment went on uninterrupted for hours, but when William would begin to pass out from both exhaustion and the head trauma that he'd endured, his interrogators would jam their fingers into his stomach and press them up and underneath his rib, rib cage, sending pain shooting through his body and jolting him back to life. In his exhausted state, they would continue to berate him. Aren't you sorry, Bill? Tell us how you did it. You know how you did it, and God knows you did it. Confess, Bill, and save yourself. We know you're guilty. You killed her, you son of a bitch. The game's over. You're guilty. Now tell us how you did it. Tell us, Bill. When one officer exhausted himself, another would enter the room to take his place. At one point, William said that one of his interrogators became so frustrated by his refusal to confess that he drew back his fist and punched him in the testicles as hard as he could. William writhed in agony, pulling against his restraints, but the officer continued to beat him mercilessly. Where are the hospital staff? What the f*** you doing? William also claims that his doctors and nurses, okay, here we go, who had been assured by police that their patient was a cold-blooded killer, were no help, and that two doctors even participated in the abuse at one point. What the f***? Where's your Hi Hippocratic Oath, doctors? Come on. According to William, while he was still being strapped to his bed, two men in lab coats, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Grinker, entered his room and informed him that they were there to administer medicine to help him sleep. William said that one of the doctors held two vials in his hand, one of clear liquid and another of white powder. They began combining measurements of these two ingredients into a single container, drawing up a mixture into a syringe. Seeing the needle, William protested, saying that he could sleep perfectly fine on his own if the officers would just leave him be, but the doctors didn't listen. They injected William in his right bicep and then started counting backwards from 100. William recalls hearing the number 94 before passing out. When he awoke some time later, William said that his head was even foggier and he could recall almost nothing about what had, what had been done to him while unconscious. This was because Dr. Haynes and Dr. Grinker had injected William with sodium pentanol, also known as trapanol, a fast-acting barbiturate and general anesthetic that was used as a truth serum during the early 20th century. Yeah, sodium pent 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 pentothol. I've heard of this as a truth serum. Both Dr. Haynes and Dr. Grinker later confirmed under oath that William had been given trapanol for this reason. Unsure of what had been done to him, William once again asked to be let go, but the police informed him that that wouldn't be possible. According to them, William admitted to two things while under the influence of the doctor's truth serum, that he had an alternate ego named George Merman that made him do terrible things like lie and steal, and that George Merman had killed Suzanne. After his supposed confession, William was allowed to rest, and his parents were allowed to see him for the first time. According to them, it took four days for this initial meeting to happen, meaning that William had been tortured for at least four days straight before supposedly offering his confession. However, the police were still not finished with him. You can't take this seriously. Like, a confession under torture is no confession at all. This is ridiculous. In what can only be described as one of the worst tortures imaginable, William was then given another large dose of truth serum via a lumbar puncture, but he was not provided with any anesthetic before the needle was inserted. Once again under the influence of truth serum, William was transported from the hospital to the local police station to undergo a polygraph interrogation, but the police were not able to make William cooperate because he was in so much pain that he couldn't sit upright. He had to be returned to the hospital to be sedated. Later, William would undergo two more polygraph tests, both of which would return results that the police reported were inconclusive. Once William was well enough to be released from the hospital, he was taken into custody and placed in solitary confinement. It was while being held here and still being denied a lawyer that he first heard his name on the radio. To his dismay, o. William's tussle with Officer Tiffin had been heavily reported as of the fact that the police were now charging him with the murders of Josephine, Francis, and Suzanne. Once again, the police had announced that William was the killer, citing his confession as well as the name of his alter ego, George Merman, as proof. Media outlets ate up this story and eventually twisted the name into George Murderman. Of course they did. Classy. Real classy. According to William, hearing his name on the radio made everything seem more real. He hadn't killed anyone, but the police were going to pin everything on him anyway. 
He immediately recanted the confession that he could not recall giving, but the police informed him that they were past all of that. They said that with or without his confession, they had found concrete evidence to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I get the feeling they're manufacturing some evidence. Guys, this is so shitty. The case against William Hirons. All right, now that we've heard William's side of the story, let's change gears and focus on what authorities claim they learned while investigating William Hirons and address the evidence that we have against him. To start, we'll begin with the circumstantial so that we can understand what led police to connect William to the Degman case in the first place. Shortly after William's arrest, officers searched both William's dorm room and inside his parents' house. As they had done years earlier, they found a plethora of stolen items, and among them were the missing Nazi memorabilia that had been stolen from veteran Harry Gold's home the night prior to Suzanne Degnan's murder. This placed William in the Degnan's neighborhood exactly 24 hours before Suzanne was killed. That is extremely circumstantial. Since he had been capable of quietly slipping inside Gold's window undetected, police speculated that he would have also had no trouble returning the following night to do the same thing at the Degnan's residence. What the f***? <laughs> It's like, I could probably slip into someone's house undetected just by being f***ing quiet. Does that mean you did it somewhere else? No! As for motive, the police suspected that William was a boy of many dark secrets. In his dorm room, they also found a copy of Richard von Kraft Ebbing's 1886 book, Psychopathia Sexualis, one of the first in-depth books written about sexual pathology. In it, Kraft Ebbing coins the terms sadism and masochism. Unsure of why a college students enrolled in engineering courses would be interested in researching sex or psychology, the police determined that William owning the book was evidence that he was a sexual deviant, and theorized that because Kraft Ebbing speaks about homosexuality in the book, William was secretly gay, even if he was. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> this would explain why neither Josephine Ross nor Francis Bowne have been sexually assaulted. Well, choose your lane, police. Do you think he's some sort of weird sexual deviant? This makes no sense. Alongside this, they found stolen medical equipment that they theorized could have been used to dismember Suzanne, including scalpels and other surgical equipment. Bit weird he has that, though, isn't it? Additionally, police also suspected that William was involved in even more shady dealings because the gun he had pointed at Officer Tiffin was soon linked to another crime that had been committed months earlier on December 5, 1945. That night, a woman named Marion Caldwell had been sitting in her eighth-story apartment when a bullet fired from a gun flew into her window, wounding her. William and Marion did not know each other, so it is unclear what the motivation for this attack would have been. The gun's original owner, a man named Guy Roderick, had reported it stolen two days before the shooting on December 3. Now, with the circumstantial evidence out of the way, let's look to the real hard-hitting evidence. The fingerprints, the handwriting analysis, and the eyewitnesses. Well, isn't handwriting and analysis not a real thing? That's like nonsense, right? An eyewitness is notoriously unreliable. Fingerprints, that's a good one. Let's see where that goes. According to the police, William's fingerprints matched both the bloody fingerprints found inside Francis Brown's apartment, as well as fingerprints found on the back of Suzanne's ransom note. They also stated that a handwriting expert had confirmed both the note and the lipstick writing found on Francis Brown's wall were a match to the handwriting seen in William's college essays. On top of this, Georgie Subgrinsky confirmed that William was the person he had seen in a trench coat walking towards the Degnan's home on the night of the murder. All this combined created a very convincing picture for the police. Yeah, I mean, the, th the, the fingerprint on the back of the note is pretty f***ing suspect. The handwriting analysis and the eyewitness combined with that i'd be like okay but i kind of think those are kind of pointless but the fingerprint that's a something uh this is why the police claim to be pushing so hard for a confession in the first place however after william's name was released to the public this evidence would come under some serious scrutiny let's begin with the fingerprints as they're extremely suspect for several reasons the first group to formally search the note for prints was the chicago crime detection laboratory they found that there were no usable prints on the note whatsoever however one of the department's captains timothy o'connor was not satisfied with this answer and enlisted the help of the fbi to conduct further testing he shipped the note off to be examined by their more qualified team Using a newer, more sophisticated method of fingerprint collection called iodine fuming, the FBI was able to lift two partial prints from the front of the note. They were then immediately photographed, and both the note and the photographs were returned to O'Connor in Chicago. After this, O'Connor then turned the note and the photographs over to Sergeant Thomas Laffey. Laffey then spent six months comparing the prints to all those within Chicago PD's records, coming up empty-handed. However, three days after Hiron's final arrest on June 26th, Laffey announced that he had made a match, citing at least nine separate points of comparison between William's fingerprints and those found on the front of the note. This indicated to Laffey that William had handled the note himself at some point. It was after this matchup was made, and William had given his coerced, drugged-up confession, that state's attorney William Tohey announced William's guilt to the public. He said, There can be no doubt now. 
However, that quote was very disingenuous, as there was still very much doubt. To start, nine points of comparison that Blaffey found did not live up to the FBI standard of 12 points, meaning that the prints would be very unlikely to hold up in court. Additionally, Laffey had gone on the record months before William was arrested, saying that the prints were so incomplete that it is impossible to classify them. Okay, so let's just throw out the prints already. If that wasn't enough, Laffey himself had also already compared the notes prints to the prints the Chicago PD had on file for William months before his final arrest and had determined that they were not a match. So, had William's prints changed, or was there something fishy going on here? Well, they don't change. There's something fishy going on here. We'll come back to the notes fingerprints in just a moment. For now, let's jump over to the bloody print that was found inside Francis Brown's apartment. This one was also originally determined to not be a match for William. However, 12 days after William's arrest, Laffey came out and stated that the fingerprints did match with at least 22 points of comparison. Was this true? Well, probably not, considering that Laffey would later tell a judge that he was only able to prove an eight-point comparison for this print as well. However, this did not stop the Chicago PD from announcing to the media that both prints were a perfect match. But then, <laughs> Chicago PD, you useless. Do your goddamn job. Not only by getting this guy in prison, you're not only you incarcerating an innocent man, potentially executing an innocent man, you're also meaning that whoever the real killer is, is still out there. Do your goddamn job. Once rumors about the prints began to circulate around the department, Laffey then came out and reported that the print that new prints had been discovered on the reverse size of Susan Note. This time, it was a palm print that also matched William perfectly. Now, if your BS meter is not already going off, oh Matt it is, let me explain a few of the reasons that this discovery is incredibly suspicious. First, this reverse side palm print was not discovered until approximately two weeks after William's arrest, meaning that the Chicago PD had somehow held the note in their possession for over six months without discovering it. Missing a print like this would have been highly unlikely as during those six months, the Chicago PD's crime detection laboratory, the FBI, and Laffey himself had all examined the note extensively without discovering it. The print also did not appear in the photographs returned to Chicago by the FBI, meaning that it was not present during their testing. So, does this mean that Laffey himself planted the prints? Well, not necessarily, because there was actually another reason that these fingerprints and the note itself would eventually be considered inadmissible in court. Police had broken the note's chain of custody multiple times throughout the investigation. According to Walter Storm, Chicago's chief of police at the time, only William Hirons handled the note before it was collected as evidence, but according to the chief of Chicago's crime detection laboratory, Charles Wilson, quote, when we got the Degnan note, it came late after other people had photographed and handled it. Furthermore, the FBI's report also stated, it is evident that the note has been handled considerably. On the morning of the note's discovery, Everyone, from Suzanne's parents to multiple detectives at the scene, had touched it, and none of them were wearing gloves or following proper protocol. If you recall, the police that day didn't even realize it was a ransom note at first because it was discovered balled up on the floor of her room. They thought it was a tissue at first glance. Beyond this, it was also later revealed that the note had been given to Chicago Daily News reporter Frank San Hamill shortly after it was returned by the FBI. This was done so that Hamill could search the note for cryptographic hidden messages. Why he was not provided with a copy of the note instead of the original is beyond imagination. <laughs> It's insane amounts of incompetence. But even if the note had been allowed to proceed as evidence at trial, it would have proved little, as the police's initial claim that William's handwriting matched the note and the lipstick writing on Francis Brown wall was also dubious. The claim stemmed solely from the expert analysis performed by the same reporter, Frank San Hamill, who was not actually an expert by any definition of the word. It merely eyeballed it. Just a report. Handwriting analysis, I thought was nonsense. And it's definitely nonsense if it's not from someone who's an expert in handwriting analysis, but just rather a reporter. Like, what the f***? After the origin of this claim was revealed, an independent handwriting expert, there we go, named George W. Schwartz, who was an actual expert, was called in to provide a second assessment. By this point, the chain of custody was already out of the window, so it didn't really matter who handled it. Schwartz stated that without a doubt, quote, the individual characteristics in the two writings do not compare in any respect. Boom. That shuts the door on that doesn't it? Later, the FBI agreed with Schwartz's assessments and stated that reporter Frank San Hamill's assessment, quote, indicated either a lack of knowledge on his part or a deliberate attempt to deceive. Oh, sh 
you're gonna get in trouble if it's a, if it's deliberate hamel to many this proved without a doubt that the handwriting did not match however the police could not accept this and brought in another expert this time it was a man named herbert j walter who had worked on the Lindbergh baby kidnapping a decade earlier in 1932 after comparing all the writing he declared there were a few superficial similarities and a great many dissimilarities months later however walter would pull a complete 180 by changing his mind and publicly supporting the police's claims that the handwriting matched why was he pressured by the police to do this well there's no direct evidence of any pressure so that's up for you to decide but please keep in mind that he certainly wasn't the first person the chicago pd pressured into saying something that wasn't true he got pressured in my opinion allegedly like come on now of course he did speaking of which that brings us to the final claim linking william to the murders the eyewitness account but in my opinion this eyewitness testimony is unreliable at best most eyewitness testimony is unreliable at best george e subgrinsky originally told authorities that he had spotted someone wearing a light-colored fedora and a dark overcoat walking towards the degnan's residence with their shopping with a shopping bag on the night of suzanne's murder he later id'd william as that man however in the original description given to police subgrinsky claimed that the mysterious man was five foot nine 170 pounds and 35 years old this was a far cry from the lanky 17 year old boy that police now had in custody <laughs> all of this evidence is nonsense if this guy goes down for this i will be i mean not shocked because chicago pd seem like absolute clowns but i'll be very sad so Grinsky had originally stated that he could not give a description of the man's face because it was too dark but he later changed his story after william's arrest claiming that he'd seen the boy's face as he crossed in front of a pair of headlights further complicating things Subgrinsky failed to recognize a photo of William when it was first shown to him and it wasn't until the police either found or fabricated other evidence against William that Subgrinsky's story very conveniently changed so after hearing all of that what evidence was the police left to work with they had the gun that had been used to shoot Marion Caldwell through her apartment window but it could never be proven that William had pulled the trigger plus Chicago PD had been the ones to link the gun to the shooting through ballistic analysis and I'm not sure anything they say could be taken at face value especially since proof of this ballistic testing was never made public then it doesn't exist they had the suspicious items from William's dorm room the book on sexual psychology and the bag of stolen medical supplies however the book proved absolutely nothing and the tools were later determined to be too small to effectively dismember a cat much less a human and child those tools had no traces of biological material on them and william was able to provide a very good explanation for why he had stolen them in the first place the scalpel was useful for scraping away real names on stolen war bonds so that they could be cashed out without raising suspicions however even if william had a good explanation it wouldn't have mattered because the police had searched william's dorm without a warrant meaning that nothing they found was admissible in court anyway the fuck is going on so i asked once again what evidence was the police left to work with absolutely nothing all they had was a drugged up coerced confession made by a teenage boy who had been held in custody and tortured for at least four days straight without a lawyer or his parents by his side this is outrageous the plea deal simon i assume by this point in today's episode you might have already pointed out that at least any half decent lawyer could rip the chicago pd a new one before any jury yeah because it's uh, if this guy gets convicted i'll be like what the f whoever the prosecution lawyer was he should now be like president or some sh because god damn if you managed to convict on that to that i wholeheartedly agree but william unfortunately did not have a half decent lawyer and no jury ever heard his story because his case never went to trial instead william was pressured into accepting one of the worst plea deals i have ever read about this is how it happens oh god after being transferred from hospital to jail william was housed in solitary confinement and kept away from his parents and the other prisoners as much as possible he was however allowed to meet with members of the media who all jumped at the opportunity to speak with the cold-blooded killer to ask him why he butchered susan and killed the woman and if he was sorry for what he'd done in response william denied his guilt but his denials were reduced to single sentences within page-long articles that outlined all the ironclad evidence that police had against him by now his guilt was all but confirmed in the public's eyes and reporters were only interested in hearing about william's nefarious alter ego george murderman instead of doing any type of investigative journalism they printed stories about how william would change into george murderman in a split second about how his eyes would narrow and become wolf-like as he stared at you dreaming of ripping you into pieces like he had done suzanne the f you're just making it up this is just fiction you're supposed to be the news come on it was all beyond sensationalized yet yeah, sensationalized whereas you take something with like a grain of truth and you make it seem more interesting than it is 
This is just writing. His eyes turned into a wolf size. Do you like? No, they didn't. What are you talking about? Wanting to help their son in any way they could, George and Margaret attempted to hire an attorney, but they could not afford one. Instead, William was provided with multiple court-appointed attorneys to serve as his defense counsel. However, it was clear from the very beginning that these attorneys were not on William's side. Um, what the f***? Look, everyone's entitled to a defense, even murderers. Even if he had done this and all these horrible things, I still think he's entitled to a lawyer who is on his side, rather than just being like, well, f*** that guy he's going to prison i rest my case there were three in total their names were john and malachi cochlan two brothers who had practiced criminal law together for many years and roland tal a civil attorney why has he got a civil attorney that's a bit concerning <laughs> it's like what's your last case ah oh, some antitrust stuff what's this one? Oh, brutal murder okay i'm just the best goddamn bird lawyer in the world at first, all three men claimed to the press that William was innocent, but what they told the media and what they told William in private were two vastly different things. Now, whether these attorneys were in the pocket of the Chicago DA's office has been hotly debated for over 80 years. That is a hell of an accusation, and no definitive answer has ever been reached. I once again allow you to decide for yourself based on what information has been released and what William claims happened between him, his attorneys, and state attorneys William Tuhi behind closed doors. Okay, I mean, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So, to say that the DA is colluding with the defense attorney to, like, to not provide this guy a defense is really a claim. So I'm going to need some pretty good evidence there. Almost immediately, John Coughlin and William Toey began meeting up regularly behind William's back to discuss the case and iron out a potential plea deal. Okay, fine. Attorneys allowed to meet without the clients and maybe talk about a potential deal. That seems fine. The deal that Toohey offered William via Coughlin was simple. Confess to the murders of Suzanne Degnan, Francis Brown, and Josephine Ross, and William would be given a single life sentence with the option to be released on probation after 20 years. There would be no charges for the many burglaries, and the possibility of the death penalty would be completely removed from the equation. When William was informed of the deal, he says that he was shocked and confused. He once again claimed that he was innocent, but he said that those claims fell on deaf ears, as not even his own attorneys would believe him. John Coughlin told William in no uncertain terms that he should accept the deal because he could think of no way to mount a credible defense because the evidence against him was so strong. What have you been smoking? Plus, even if a plausible defense could be eventually crafted, the case had garnered too much public attention for impartiality. Any jury comprised of Chicago residents would be biased in a very unfavorable way. So, move for a... Uh, having the... what's it called? Where they move for a, like, new location? You gotta go somewhere else. And this is the past. So just take them somewhere else. They probably have never heard of him because there's no internet. He urged William to take the deal, both for his own sake and to avoid the further negative publicity that a lengthy trial would generate. When William continued to protest his innocence because he couldn't imagine spending at least 20 years of his life in prison, Coughlin then informed him that prison was unavoidable with or without the plea deal. Even if William somehow beat the murder charges, his prior criminal record meant that his many burglary charges would easily warrant a life sentence for burglary. Oh, he did do it with a gun once, though, so that's like... Um, aggravated burglary or robbery or whatever so that's gonna be pretty intense you're gonna get i mean you could get 20 years for that i feel in america without the immunity the plea deal guaranteed he would almost certainly spend the rest of his life in prison Coughlin then told william that if the case did go to trial and he lost too he would seek the death penalty which in those days meant being sent to the electric chair this was a nightmare scenario for young william who had only weeks earlier been in college and on the fast track to an engineering job that would permanently put his fam his and his family's money struggles behind them yeah, and it's also like, this dude's a kleptomaniac. Like, he can't control it. He's just stealing because he gets excited by it. It's like almost a medical condition. I mean, it probably is. Is that in the DSM? Kleptomania? Probably. Because the boy was still hesitant, Coughlin also told William that he should accept the deal soon because 20 years for three homicides was by far the best deal he'd ever negotiated, especially considering the high publicity of the case. I mean, it's, if, it, if he had killed these people... That's not a bad f***ing deal, to be honest. <laughs> if William took too long to consider, he risked the police finding more evidence against him and rescinding the deal entirely. Under such immense pressure, William caved and agreed to cooperate. The next day, with the help of his lawyers, William sat behind closed doors and wrote out a detailed second confession, explaining exactly how he had killed all three victims. In it, he admitted that he'd butchered Suzanne, Suzanne with a large hunting knife that had been stolen from Guy Roderick's home. This was the same home that the gun William had pointed at Officer Tiffin had been stolen from. He then said that after the killing, he threw the knife out of a train window near the Degnan's residence to dispose of it. What? That's a bad idea. 
It could just land on the ground, like someone could easily find that. You gotta throw it in the ocean, the deep ocean. What are you doing? The police were able to recover this knife exactly where William said it would be. However, they were not able to find any traces of blood or other biological material anywhere on the blade. He provided similar details about the other two murders as well, effectively convincing many that he was guilty because he had intimate knowledge of the crimes. However, this second confession was not reliable either because William's attorneys essentially told him what to write. They provided him with a copy of an article from the Chicago Tribune, which outlined everything the press had reported about the killings. William was pressured to make his confession fit the press's narrative. In an interview years later, William stated, As it turned out, the Tribune article was very helpful as it provided me with a lot of details I didn't know. My attorneys rarely changed anything outright, but I could tell by their faces if I had made a mistake. Or they would say, Now, Bill, is that really the way it happened? Then I would change my story because obviously it went against what was known in the Tribune. That is crazy my dudes once the confession was complete william and his parents signed it believing that doing so would put an end to the nightmare that they'd all been living through the past month i mean yes but now he's gonna spend 20 years in prison however it would take less than a day for william to change his mind and attempt to recant the statement and he would do so in a way that would make everything 10 times worse for himself on July the 30th, William was transported alongside his attorneys to the office of Prosecutor Tui, where his confession was scheduled to officially be accepted and entered into the record. Because of the notoriety of the case, several members of the press had been invited to witness the process to prove that William had made a confession. William was marched before the press by Tui and told to state his guilt and answer any questions that the press had of him honestly. This is when William's anger at the situation boiled over. According to him, quote, It was Tui himself. After assembling all the officials, including attorneys and policemen, he began a preamble about how long everyone had waited to get a confession from me. But at last, the truth was going to be told. He kept emphasizing the word truth, and I asked him if he really wanted the truth. He assured me that he did. Now Tui made a big deal about hearing the truth. Now when I was being forced to lie to save myself, it made me very angry. So I told them the truth, and everyone got very upset. In front of the press, William refused to take responsibility for the murders. He would not answer the questions and instead told them exactly what was on his mind and what he thought about the investigation. What Exactly what was said is not documented, but William quickly was ushered out of the room and placed in a holding cell. There he was berated by both Tui and his own attorneys for changing his story. Tui was so furious at the embarrassment that his face was blood red. He immediately rescinded his plea agreement and said that William would also face additional charges with the murder of Esther Carey. If you recall, I don't recall, <laughs> Estelle was the girlfriend of Chicago mobster and Al Capone associate Nick Dean, now I remember, who had been tortured and killed after cooperating with the authorities. Um, that was a completely unrelated case. We already decided that that is like not in any way related, and she was definitely killed by the mob for being a grass. According to William, Tui told him that he had blown the best deal he would ever get. Tui then offered William a new deal with new terms, but in this one, William would now serve three consecutive life sentences, one for each murder, and would not be eligible for parole. The only benefits the new deal would provide is a guarantee to avoid a trial, safety from the death penalty, and no additional charge for the burglaries or the murder of Estelle Carey. Do those matter? I mean, three consecutive life sentences? 60 years, you're dying in prison. William was terrified. Everyone in the room was against him, and he felt he had no option but to accept the new terms without question. Anything else was a surefire ticket to the electric chair. William was marched back out before the press. This time he took responsibility for the murders, answered the press's questions in a manner that Tui deemed appropriate, and even acted out the murders for everyone's amusement. What the f***? From this moment on, William Hirons was officially guilty, both in the eyes of the public and in the eyes of the law. But not in the eyes of this podcaster. A life lost. After one of the worst days of William's life was over, he felt a mixture of relief, anger, and depression as he was transported to Stateville Prison in Joliet, in Juliet, Illinois, to begin serving his sentence. However, his beaten attitude would not last long as he refused to accept his fate lying down. After finding his bearings inside prison, William began preparing to file his first appeal. He worked for three full years, reading and learning everything that he could about the law, about trial procedure, about appealing plea deals. He sought only one thing, a real trial. He wanted his coerced confessions acknowledged and the rotten plea deal to be thrown out. Yeah, this is interesting, right? If you're in prison, and because you can rep represent yourself in court if you're not a liar, you've just got loads of time. So just study the law, study your case, and just become your own lawyer. Just learn everything that you need to learn. You've got loads of time. You've probably got a big library full of law books. Just grind on it. Be like, what do they, is it called like a jailhouse attorney? Like the guy who learns about law in prison and then provides the other prisoners with advice? 
<laughs> That's kind of cool. He wanted his coerced confessions acknowledged and the rotten plea deal to be thrown out. He wanted to go before a jury and show them how the police had nothing against him, how they had framed him, and that the real killer was still out there somewhere. In 1952, William was transported back to Chicago to stand before a judge for the first time since his sentencing. He spent ten full days watching as over 40 witnesses testified about their involvement in his investigation, his interrogation, and the plea deal itself. Many things were learned during these testimonies. First, it became clear that State Attorney William Toohey had been pulling strings to secure William's guilt since the very beginning. Toohey admitted on the record that he had personally paid one of the doctors, Dr. Grinker, $1,000 to administer the truth serum to William that resulted in his first confession. Are you shitting me? That's insane. Also, $1,000 in the 1950s? Toohey has money! This confession was also revealed to be completely fabricated, as Dr. Grinker testified that William had never rendered a confession while under the influence of the truth serum. Oh no! That's crazy! Directly contradicting what the Chicago PD had told the press at the time. This guy, I really... What was this chapter called? A Life Lost. Oh god. I, I'm i kind of... The title makes me think this isn't going to happen. Of this, the, the subtitle, the title of this section. But I'm really hoping... That he gets a not guilty, and then the Chicago PD have to pay him a f load of money for spending three years in prison and making his life a misery because f them. Grinker also said that William had never admitted to having an alter ego named George Murderman, who was who made him commit crimes. This whole sensationalized aspect of the story arose after interrogators asked William who had killed Suzanne, to which William simply re responded, George. Because no transcript of this interrogation has ever been released, no one can say for sure who George was, but it is believed that William was likely calling out for help from his father, George, as opposed to implicating anyone. The police were the ones that had turned George into William's alter ego. Additionally, William had never once given the name Merman. Instead, it simply murmured when the interrogator asked for George's last name. The name written down by police was George Murmur, which was then changed to George Merman, which was then reported as George Murderman. This is in insane. This is an insane miscarriage of justice. Furthermore, because of this appeal, speculation arose that the police had also purposefully suppressed information that could have aided in William's defense, had his attorneys been attempting to organize one. If you recall, the police claimed that the two polygraph tests they administered shortly after William's arrest were inconclusive, but the veracity of those claims were called into question when later reassessments of the test's results showed otherwise. In 1953, Johnny Reed put all doubts to rest. Reed was a former Chicago police detective and the creator of the now famous Reed Technique. Oh wow, that's the interrogation technique that's extremely effective at getting people to com confess to crimes, even if they haven't committed crimes. <laughs> Made an Into the Shadows video about it, I think. There's another channel I do. That year, he re-examines William's results for a textbook that he was writing called Lie Detection and Criminal Investigation, in which he states in no uncertain terms that the tests show William had been truthful about not killing Suzanne. In my opinion, that fact alone settles the debate about whether the police were attempting to frame William. Even if you don't trust the results of the polygraphs, it doesn't matter. The police trusted them, and they still lied to leave open the possibility of guilt. All in all, William's appeal led to much of the information in this episode being revealed, and is one of the only reasons that questions regarding his guilt arose in the first place. Yet despite everything, these ten days of hearings were not enough. William's appeal was denied. Bro, he brought so much. In an interview years later, William said, It was politics from the get-go. When a crime happens, people want it solved right away. And they don't care how it's solved. After recovering from this crushing defeat, William set out to start a new appeal, refusing to accept his life behind bars and holding on to hope that someone would eventually give him a fair trial. He said that prison life never felt real to him. It always felt like an interim period, and that he'd eventually move on from it. Determined to stay productive, William spent all the money his parents sent him every month on his education, taking every college course that was available to him and becoming the first prison inmate to earn a bachelor's degree in the state of Illinois. Good for him. After this, he then returned to his engineering roots by taking courses on radio and television repair, eventually becoming so proficient in the classes he enjoyed that the prison's administration made him the official instructor. He was also allowed to operate his own repair shop for the prison and other inmates. That's cool. This guy's making the most of it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got to suck to be in prison, but at least this dude's up to sh In his downtime, William also helps other inmates appeal their convictions. Ah, oh, he's a jailhouse lawyer. Awesome. Watching many go free and continuing to hope that he would someday be freed as well when one of his appeals landed in the hands of the right person. However, as the years dragged on, that possibility seemed less and less likely. During one of his failed appeals during the 1960s, long after William's youthful teenage face had morphed into that of a hardened adult man, William was told, You have done beautiful things, but there are just too damn many people that remember this case. You have to just allow time to be in your favor on this. William tried to take this advice, but he could never make himself see prison as his home. He couldn't be content until he was let out. 
and so he continued to file appeals. In the late 1970s, when William was in his late 40s, he was transferred to Stateville Honor Farm, a minimum security farming prison where food crops were grown and harvested by prisoners. According to William, he hoped that this would be a nice reprieve from the maximum security lifestyle he'd grown accustomed to, but it wasn't. Many of the prisoners housed at Stateville Honor Farm were former and current Chicago gang members. Without a strong warden to keep them all in line, William said the mob effectively ran things. When an opportunity for him to be transferred yet again arose, he took it. This time, William found himself housed in Vienna, an experimental, minimum security co-ed prison where inmates were referred to as the residents. Co-ed prison, as in men and women in the same prison. Okay. This time, William's life did improve, as he described Vienna as more of a college campus than a prison, saying that the residents and staff were kind and courteous to one another. There were no fights, no stabbings, no sexual assaults. There were also no bars on the windows and no fences around the property's perimeter, because nobody wanted to escape. All the residents knew that if they tried, they'd be recaptured and sent back to a maximum security prison for life. Yeah, I'd, I'd just be like, I'm staying it. I'm going to be a good boy. No prison escapes. I like it at college. For those who had grown accustomed to the freedom the Vienna offered, this was a fate worse than death. Things in Vienna were so lax that William began taking EMT classes while, while there and was eventually allowed to get a job outside the prison working as an ambulance driver. He was truly one of the most trusted inmates in the entire state, and it was while living in Vienna that after nearly 40 years in prison, William received his first bit of good news. Oh my lord. 40 years. 40 years. In 1983, U.S. Magistrate Gerald P. Cohn ordered that William be released upon time served after his latest appeal. He stated that continuing to deny William's parole was unconstitutional because despite changing laws that were prioritizing punishment over rehabilitation, William was legally considered rehabilitated. All his charges had officially been discharged that year, so absolutely nothing was preventing his release. However, this ruling would be short-lived. When word reached the public that William was going to be released, people protested, leading to the creation of the Committee to Remember Suzanne Degnan. This committee was staffed by seven retired police superintendents and Illinois Attorney General Neil Hartigan. Of George Cohen, Hartigan said the following, Only God and Herons know how many other women he murdered. Now a bleeding heart do-gooder decides that Herons is rehabilitated and should go free. I'm going to make sure that kill-crazed animal stays where he is. Um, how about, how about, fuck you. After this, Judge Cohen began receiving innumerable death threats, and his decision was ultimately reversed by the Illinois State Senate in 1984, just before William's scheduled release date. This was perhaps the most crushing blow of William's life, and things only got worse from here. Eventually, the Vienna experiment was deemed a failure and shut down after several high-profile mobsters were transferred into the program, and the entire campus became a hotbed for drug dealing, violence, and riots. Vienna was retrofitted with bars, fences, and guard towers, turning it into just another prison. How about? If there's a mobster there, and he turns out to be a mobster, send him back to uh, send him back to maximum security prison, supermax, or whatever. Don't let him be at the nice college prison. Let people like William be there, and like other people who are either non-violent or like really reformed, and on their way out of prison. It seems crazy that what happens. This could have worked. By 1998, William developed diabetes and soon lost the ability to walk. He was transferred to another minimum security prison in Dixon, Illinois, where he resided permanently in the hospital ward. Throughout this time, he continued to find, file new appeals, and in 2000, new efforts were made to have William released when activists took an interest in the case. This interest revealed evidence that the fingerprints the police had used to tie William to the murder showed evidence of being rolled, meaning that they were almost certainly planted by someone within the department. What the f man? It just gets worse and worse. This is wild. There were also scattered reports that the lipstick message on Frances Brown's wall wasn't even written by her killer, as it was alleged that a member of the press had hastily scrawled the message at the crime scene to make the murder more interesting to the public. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Around this time, the FBI also conducted new handwriting analysis on the note. They arrived at the same conclusion as several experts had in the 1940s. We're in the 21st century now! William had not written it. Furthermore, because William had been instructed to craft his second confession around the publicly available information reported by the media, a new comparison between William's confession and the known facts of the case yielded 29 serious inconsistencies, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that William's confession did not reflect reality. All of this resulted in new calls for clemency, with Stephen Drigin from Northwestern Law School Center for Wrongful Convictions leading the charge. Legend. Yet no headway could be made. That's a shame. Drigin said, I don't know that they really care so much about his guilt or innocence anymore. I think they're just invested in keeping him locked up for the rest of his life. 
In one of his final parole hearings in 2007, the Illinois Parole Board unanimously voted 14 to 0 to deny William any sort of release. One of the board members stated, God will forgive you, but the state won't. William never stopped fighting for release. He filed over 30 appeals throughout his life, yet every single one of them was rejected. He died in prison on March 5, 2012, due to complications from his diabetes. He was 83 years old, and 65 of those years had been spent behind bars, making him the state's longest-serving prisoner. So they just ruined his whole f***ing life. And someone out there got away with murder. A police department ruined this guy's life. Who else? The first article I read about this case stated with certainty that William Hirons was a guilty man and the idea that the Chicago PD forced him into a confession was a fringe conspiracy theory pushed online by anti-police trolls. Because of this, I dove into the case with a much different direction for this script in mind. The idea of writing about a fringe conspiracy theory excited me, so I eagerly reserved the topic, with my only concern being that there would not be enough credible evidence behind the conspiracy to make it believable or interesting. I assumed, based on this initial reading, that William was guilty, but I have now arrived at the exact opposite conclusion. Truthfully, I cannot say with certainty that William did not kill today's victims, but what I can say is that justice was not served either way. It seems so unlikely. And even if it, he is guilty, there's nowhere near enough evidence to convict. Even if William did kill them, the process by which he was convicted and imprisoned for life has left a black mark on the justice system that I don't think can easily be repaired. I choose to believe that William was innocent, not only because his past offences did not fit the lead-up to cold-blooded murder, but because there was also nothing tying him to the case other than his confession, which was dubious from the very start. I believe that had William's case gone to trial, he would have been found not guilty. In fact, I'll go a step further and say that I believe his case would have never gone to trial in the first place if he hadn't confessed. The police would be forced to back down and recant their statements to the media, just as they had done multiple times with prior suspects. As for why William's appeals for release were never granted, this is something else I don't have the answer to. Unless there is something about the case that we don't know, something that hasn't been reported, or something that I and everyone else have somehow missed, this is by far the most egregious miscarriage of justice that I've ever written about. Yet it all seems worse when you realize that if William was innocent, Suzanne, Francis, and Josephine's real killer or killers were free and almost certainly died without ever facing justice. In my opinion, the best suspect the police ever found was a man named Richard Russell Thomas. Thomas was a resident of Phoenix, Arizona, who worked as a male nurse in hospital, but occasionally posed as a surgeon to his friends because he liked the attention. All right. <laughs> don't they? Don't, they're not like, they don't remember going to medical school for like a long ass time. He was visiting Chicago on the night Suzanne was killed and had returned home to Phoenix immediately after. He also had an extensive criminal history of spousal abuse and burglary and had previously been convicted of extortion after threatening to kidnap a little girl for ransom. At the time William was arrested, Thomas was sitting inside a, inside a jail cell in Arizona on charges that he'd molested his own daughter. While being questioned by authorities in connection with this, Thomas openly confessed to murdering Suzanne without prompting. He said that the Degnan's residence was directly across the street from a car rental agency he frequented, and that he'd snuck into her room, killed her, dismembered her, and then distributed her body parts before returning to Arizona. Well, it seems like this is your dude, <laughs> unless there's some other conspiracy behind him as well. One of the drains, where several parts of her body were discovered, was directly adjacent to this rental agency. Very soon after this, Arizona authorities notified the Chicago police, who then sent down several detectives to interview Thomas themselves the following day. They administered their own polygraph and were attempting to determine if Thomas's confession was legitimate when they were suddenly called back to Chicago without warning. William, they later learned, had given a confession and the police had decided to shift all their focus to him in order to not confuse the narrative. I mean, God forbid you actually have to do some complicated policing. I mean, that would be a shame, wouldn't it? 63 years of his life in prison. According to the police, William was a much better fit for the crime, as Thomas's confession contained elements that were not consistent with the facts of the case. It also recanted his confession almost immediately, and there was no physical evidence tying him to the scene. Thomas was never investigated again in relation to Suzanne's murder. He died in prison on unrelated charges in 1974. All documentation of his confession has been destroyed, meaning that no further research into him can be conducted. And that's where we end today's episode pretty sad to be honest and there was just killer out there free in my opinion thanks for listening